first of all, can you can you all see me? I see this column here. Can you all see me? Is this a good location for me to stand? I, I, I got the poll about how many of you are from Sydney Pacific and how many of you are from MIT. The most important question to me is how many of you are from Venezuela? <laughs> Three! Alright. <laughs> Welcome the two of you from <laughs> Uh, look, thank you for having me here. Um, the, the, what, what I'm doing is, I, I wish I had something much deeper to talk to you in this in this uh, 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 distinguished lecture series. This is not particularly very deep, but it's important to me, and I would like to hear your points of view. What I'm going to say, I assembled a set of slides, and I basically I'm going to different parts of MIT presenting them. And the set of slides summarize a set of ideas that I do. I actually need the microphone. I do? Okay, because I can scream pretty loud. <laughs> uh, I, 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 the set of ideas summarize what I said at the inaugural uh, speech that I gave back in September. So this is the agenda. I'm going to briefly tell you why I'm doing this. Uh, and these are the three areas that I'm going to be covering, education, research, and community, which has a broad uh, uh, statement that I'll clarify that later and then conclude. So this is the part of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, why am I doing this? Uh, obviously, because I want to listen to you. Uh, it's funny that I say I want to listen to you when I'm the only one talking, but, but you will be asking some questions, I'm sure. Uh, these are the groups that I have organized. So uh, there are 12 faculty sessions with faculty for, uh, so that all five schools can, can be participating. I went to Lincoln Lab already. I'm doing this. This is, this is one of those in which I meet with students and I want to talk to them and listen to what they have to say, particularly important to me. I would, it's important for me to hear from grad students because quite a bit of the educational points that I'm going to make are about the future. And the future really belongs to you. Quite a fraction of you will move on to become professors in academia. And, and, and this is the future that you may experience if you move in that direction. Um, a bunch of uh, sessions with staff. I have monthly office hours. Some of you have taken advantage of them. Um, they, I, I learned quite a bit from those. Uh, there are two hours every month, and, uh, and they cut off into 15-minute chunks, so there is not a lot you can say, but at least you can, I, I listen to you in my office, and, and I've gotten quite a bit of feedback that way. Faculty meet, there is one tomorrow, uh, and I've been doing, I, I made this presentation there as well, and there is more. So that's basically what I'm doing, and, and the reason I'm doing it is to share with you my thoughts uh, and, and the things that I think we should emphasize to get feedback and to listen to whatever you have in mind. And there will hopefully there will be plenty of time to cover not just what I'm saying, but any other topics with questions that you have in mind to cover. Okay, with that, let's talk, let's start with the, with, with the main, the bulk of the presentation. I'm gonna start with education. By the way, these are very, um, those colors have nothing to do with the colors that I put together. Uh, let me tell you what I intended to do. If you look on the laptop, you'll find that this is supposed to be dark blue. Uh, this is supposed to be white, which is kind of okay. And I don't remember which color this is, but this yellow doesn't look right. But anyway, uh, you, you, the information is there, and, and that's, that's all that matters. So let's talk about education. This is something that I said in the, uh, back in September, that we should invent the residential research university of the future, we should do it right here. Now, why did I say that? And what does that mean? By the way, we're going to invent it together. Nobody here will do what they don't want to do. And that's part of the, what the task force is all about, to, to just do this whole thing together. But why do I think that? And why do I say that? Uh, why do we have to invent the residential research university of the future? I think these are two issues that we have been dealing with for a while. Uh, and, and, and everybody went through the undergraduate years went through this kind of pain. One thing that people do not know is that it's extremely expensive for universities, at least for MIT, to educate undergraduates. Uh, if you have not seen these figures, and I've been saying those publicly, uh, for MIT to educate our undergraduate, it costs MIT about 70 some thousand dollars per year for undergraduate. Say 75, 
to, to round that out. That's the cost to MIT. What we charge, though, is not that. We charge a tuition. And for those who pay full tuition at MIT, which is about 10, 12% of the MIT undergrad population, uh, we charge them a tuition of about $40,000 a year. This tuition of $40,000 for those who have to pay is very high. Of course, many at MIT are on financial aid as undergraduates. Over 60% or so have MIT financial aid. Uh, but as I said, only 10% or so pay full tuition. For those who pay full tuition, this is very high. And you see the press complaining constantly about the tuition that universities charge, including MIT's. But as I just told you, the tuition, the price to a student, is not near, not even, it's a little over half what it's costing us to educate. So that's a, that's a, a gap, number one. Number two, because of places like MIT that offer financial aid, the net, not everybody gets the same financial aid, but the net financial aid per student is about half of the tuition. In other words, if it's costing us 75 grand per student per year undergraduate, and we're receiving revenues, a net of about 20,000 per student per year. We have a gap of $55,000 per student per year. Multiply that by 4,500 students, and you see a huge gap there. That's the reality of the day. And that gap has been increasing. Now, we have been dealing with that for years, trying to figure out how to lower costs, which is very hard, because the cost of a university is dictated by how many buildings we have to maintain and how many people we have to run the place. So if you want to lower costs, you have to either level some buildings or you know, reduce the number of people. And those two things are impossible for us to do with the quality of the efficient we provide. So we cannot do much about this, and we're working hard on that. We, for those of you who were around uh, during the financial crisis in 2008, we had to cut the budget by $120 million. And that was extremely painful. We did it. Uh, but it's very, very hard to do that. Uh, so we have done as best as we can on this side. And then we have the issue of price. And financial aid is part of who we are. And and mission is part of who we are. So, so there is nothing we can do about that either. And as I said, that gap is increasing. So this is bad to begin with. And we have to sort that out. And I intend to work on sorting this out. And, and I'll tell you later some ideas that I have on that. But the reason these two issues became so serious now is, is the low cost online alternatives. It depends on how that's going to be used. That is a threat. Uh, it could be a good thing. I believe it will be a great thing. But it is also a threat. So, so these two things together with this becomes a major, almost an existential crisis of the residential model. So, uh, you may wonder, why do I view this as a threat? By the way, I view that as an opportunity, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a few minutes, but, but, but when you think of how that could be used, it could be a threat for the residential model that is facing that gap that I described. Uh, so, so you may wonder, well, what, what, what seems to be the problem? What if those alternatives actually thrive and do very well, and if they thrive, and, 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 and you can take, you can choose, I don't mean you individually, but students by and large globally or in America can choose something low cost to get a degree that is decent quality of instruction with the new technology, as opposed to paying a ton of money uh, to come to university. In addition to that, the university costs them a ton of money to educate a student, then what you can see is that, is that the residential model will be seriously threatened. So that's what I mean by creating an existential problem. Uh, now, I have said this before, and, and so you wouldn't be surprised if you would hear that some people react to this and say, well, you know, so what? Uh, so what if the residential model goes away? Uh, people would say to me, and they have said to me, <clears throat> uh, and these are smart people, people who have made a lot of money, and they could make a difference in terms of where they invest the money or where they want to. Uh, to invest the future of education. I have heard people say, it's about time you guys go the way with Barnes and & Noble and Borders and just go out of business. I mean, you have had your run, now let's just get a new technology. And I'm not making this up. 
there are quite a few people who think that way. But, but I think the problem, even if you accept that way of thinking, is that it's short-sighted because that model, in my view, uh, is the best one to incubate leaders. Uh, and I can explain why I say that. But it's the best one also to create new knowledge, which is absolutely important. And by creating new knowledge, it's the best one that creates a new course that, that we constantly, in universities, particularly MIT, we're just recreating and reinventing to, to educate. Basically, if the online model, the residential model, is going to die just as well, because who's going to feed courses to the online model? Who's going to provide the knowledge that the online model needs to sustain itself? So anyway, that's the threat of the situation. This is a, a reality because some people, quite a few people, think that way. They're trying to figure out models to threaten what we have on campus. And again, I can e elaborate on that um, as you wish. But, yeah. Right. Um, so I don't, I, 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 I don't agree with those people. Still, put that from, from the obvious. I see the obvious question I have in your argument is: There's nothing keeping MIT or similar residential model from existing is basically a research laboratory, taking in funding, performing research, generating a new knowledge, um, and uh, incubating leaders at the graduate level without the undergraduates even present. So uh, what's the answer to that? Yes, okay, so your point is, uh, uh, what, if, what if, let's imagine a future in which universities basically become grad schools? in which we can do all the things we do today. And, and, and the undergraduate part, you know, what, what are we gonna lose if that goes away? I think, I think you're right that, that these two things, uh, the second and third bullet, uh, will be maintained in the graduate model. I, I agree with you. But the problem that we have is, is here. Uh, I believe that, that the campus education model allows students to work with each other, to learn from each other, to learn how to negotiate, to learn how to persuade, to learn how to lead, to decide when it's okay to follow and when it's okay to lead. I mean, all those skills to learn ethics, uh, uh, all those skills, you, you don't learn them if you only have an online education, online instruction. I wouldn't call it education, online instruction. So I, I think that let me put it this way. I think that if you only have online instruction, only online instruction, uh, because another model is having an MIT X instruction and do it in a different campus. That, that's, a, that's another hybrid approach. But if you only have online instruction, I think you can learn the skills to get a job and to be very productive. But I don't think you can learn the skills to, uh, to, to be a manager. To be a little, to be the CEO of the company, I don't think you can learn those skills. Now I could be wrong, but that's 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 my point of view. So I think that's what we, the society misses that level. Uh, it's also not clear to me that if you have only an online education, how do you get from an online bachelor degree, uh, which is almost equivalent to being homeschooled in a way? and then plug in into this environment as a grad student, work in a team, and so forth. How does that transition happen? So, but those are excellent questions, and, and there, is, there is food for debate right there. And there is quite a few people who are actually thinking that your model is the way to work, uh, the way that things could work, and they're trying to provide what I just described as uh, the drawbacks of having the online model by providing an environment in which you can study, say, MITx. Or, or, uh, or even OCW. Uh, I know a university in north of Shanghai that the whole curriculum is OCW. And so, so basically the campus, is there is a campus with professors and, and, and students and they're interacting, but they don't teach, they just guide you, they give you exams, but the curriculum is OCW. So my point is there are models of people already thinking, oh, you, you think that what you need, your only problem, they tell me, is that you don't want people to just study online at home. I provide a campus. I, I, I build buildings, I build dorms. I have a, it's like a summer camp. You, you, you put buildings and dorms, and you create an environment in which students do things with each other, and they learn MITx. Would that fix the problem? And yes, it would fix the problem that I said. But if you have a campus like that, without the professors doing, and the students doing, without you, 
then, then that's also not enriching enough. But all those are, are, are things that people are thinking and, and options that people are exploring. Uh, yes, please. This, so I am an undergrad right now. Level, um, from the interactive people at the PDI level and at the graduate level. Um, and so I think it would be just like a fundamentally different experience if you didn't have that option interaction. I, I had I had uh, summarize what you said. I'm sorry. Summarize oh. what you said. Well I think the point that you just made is that is that uh, uh, as undergraduates the, one of the the best experience at MIT is just to do to, to do Europe, to do right. projects with, with other, to be benefited, to work with grad students, and that kind of interaction. I, I yeah. think, did that yeah, exactly. Hard? It's the most fun part. Now, one, one, <laughs> one, one, I just, just last week, I had one of my freshman advisees. Uh oh, she's not here, right? That's freshman. <laughs> one of my freshman advisees, she came with a drop, drop card for me to sign. And, and I asked her, why are you dropping this course? And she said, well, because I found this, this is a freshman, this is a second semester student. She found this Europe she loves doing, and she does not want to spend six hours in a classroom where she could use them working with that Europe, with that some grad student somewhere. So that's the experience that you get in a place like this, which the classroom doesn't quite give you. There was another hand, yes, please. So going along with that, you know, I think that there are those students, um, those undergrads that want an education, not just instruction, and this model could coexist along with an online instruction model for undergraduates who just want a degree. Uh, have you considered that the residential system might shrink but not be displaced by this new online The system? residential model will not be displaced. Uh, I, I just I just mentioned the threats because I, I just want us to be realistic on what what there is a fork on the road right now in higher education and we need to decide in which direction to go. It is my view that if we do what I'm suggesting we do, which is I, I announced this task force and I want MIT to think. Look, to me it's very simple. We have been teaching for hundreds of years uh, using uh, using two tools, basically a blackboard, more recently a whiteboard. Uh, we have been using textbooks for a while, and, and as of 10 years ago, we used OCW. Those have been the tools that we have had to teach. Now we have decided a new tool. And, and the challenge for us is, okay, how do we use it on campus? And I have some ideas on how to do that, but I want the ideas to come from, from MIT. So what I envision is a tool that we can use to enrich the, the residential model far more than it is today by providing more opportunities for students to do things, to do projects with each other and do the instruction part and use the classroom for more uh, discussion on what you learn on your own as opposed to use the classroom for you to listen to information. You can learn information on your own playing games with your computer basically and then go to a classroom to just use that information and make it into knowledge. So I don't expect this to happen but I have to say things like that because not even other college presidents in America believe that they are threatened. I mean they, 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 I, I need to wake people up so that we can take this seriously. You have not seen any single university in America doing what we're doing. I mean, we, 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 didn't, we didn't have a little startup come up with an experiment. We just said MIT is going to try this experiment. MIT is trying it, and we invited Harvard to do it. We're creating a task force for us to figure out how to use it here. That's a commitment because I envision the future, and we'll take advantage of it. We won't go away, and the residential model won't go away. But unless we realize we have a tool, let's take advantage of it. Otherwise, another approach may, may hurt us. That, 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 that's my point. Now, what, one point that I want to pay to, to, to your question is that if, if uh, one risk, even if the residential model survives because, not because we make it very exciting, but because some people want to get a degree uh, in this campus environment, we need to worry about the cost and price anyway. Because what I don't, what I want to avoid is a situation in which if you come from a very poor uh, uh, family and you graduate from high school, if you're lucky enough to be able to go to high school, many MIT students and undergrads come from families like that. And they 
uh, they have to, if, if they have a choice between going, studying online and getting a job to help the family, or going to a college, I assure you the pressure will be unbelievable for you to get a job and study online your degree. And then the colleges, instead of having the portfolio, the, the all diversified social economic stratus that MIT has, will be mostly for those who can afford to go to a college. And that also changes the, the college experience. So I want to worry about that part as well. Yeah. If you say OCW, that means open courseware? Yeah. Yeah. No, this is, OCW is basically, as you know, it's, it's, it's an electronic open book, but it's, it's not tutorial. It's, 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 it's for you to see it. You don't know if you learn something or not. Uh, it's like reading a book. Uh, you just read all of MIT stuff in there. But MIT, the AIDX platform is very tutorial. It's very fun to, it's really fun to follow, yeah, at least in my view it is. There was another question that I missed. Yeah, in the back. So I'm a senior at, um, right now in undergrad. Um, and I just wanted to add to what you were saying and just build on what you were saying. Um, so you said that MIT is important um, to build leaders. And I think that in addition to you know, what you said about how we need more interactive tools to learning, which I totally agree on, because I think I'm in biology. Even though my classes are large, we have recitation sections, I still see the need to you know, have a more interactive curriculum. Because the thing I enjoy most about being here is that I did a Europe every semester I was here. Um, and you know, like, like the other students, that I agree with that. At the same time, I think that um, people who take these online courses underestimate that the thing that I learned most as an undergrad is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of work balance, like with activities. It's a lifestyle of like approaching problems without the fear of failure. It's like all those things that, can, that I learned that's different from what a student at Harvard might learn. Um, and I think, no it is, it, it, it's a really different mindset. Um, and I think that, you know, like there's something to be said about like the quality of the student body, the students who go here, that's what makes up an undergrad community. And that's, I, I agree with you, I think the residential model is essential for that. Like, I think that the interaction between stu the student body, the undergrad student body, with the rest of the community is what makes MIT, MIT. Without that, you know, the material is pretty similar, you know, on what's online at MIT, what's taught at Harvard, it's very similar, you know, like, but I think the difference is, you know, how these students approach, you know, failures, how these students approach these classes. So. Absolutely on the money. That's exactly what I've been saying. So I think the, 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 what you, you ask any undergraduate today, and you can ask yourself that question, but I'm, I'm asking a question to undergraduates, I've asked many of them. What is that they find so special about MIT? Rarely, on occasion, they say one lecture was inspiring, but they, rarely they say the classroom experience. What they say that they love about MIT is each other, the students and doing things with each other, and, and with grad students, just Europe and stuff. That's what they love about MIT. That's what they Actually, want to say. to add to that, I think that, you know, I do find inspiration in classes, not through how the professor teaches, actually, but talking to professors outside the classroom, talking to them about, about research, you know, that's what I found I liked most about my biology professors. I, you know, not everyone's a great teacher, you know, <laughs> but, but, subjective. But, see, but, but, I thought, but that's, that's the message that I've been trying to convey to, to college presidents. I think the reason why we're gonna be here for a long time is because the world is moving basically where MIT is. I mean, we have been doing learning by doing for 150 years. They, 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 we never said the classroom is experience. Many other colleges, that's all they got. That's all they have. They have nothing else. They feel threatened. If, if the classroom experience gets threatened by the online, then what do they have to offer? We have had everything else to offer that is at the heart of it. So what we're going to be doing is offer more of that and less of the traditional passive classroom experience. We will continue the classroom experience, but we'll be a more, a more active interaction, not, we won't be passive. So we are fine, and we're going to be do, doing fine because we are where everybody else has to be. But my point, what I've been telling other college presidents is that it's exactly your point. And if all they have to offer is a classroom experience, they are going to go out of business. So they have to figure out how to offer that extra something that, that, that promotes 
faculty student interaction, student student interaction, that is the essence of, of being on that campus. Uh, it's critical if we're gonna do something with this that we, that we do it right. So let, I'm gonna be assuming that thanks to this lab and thanks to research, we'll optimize how to use this technology, which won't be the same by discipline. You're probably a very disciplined by discipline, but let's, I'm assuming that it's gonna take us a few years maybe a few PhDs, but we're gonna sort this out and wanna use this technology extremely well. So assuming that, then how could we use it? How, how, let's assume that we know how to use it. How do we use it on campus? Uh, the question is the following. The point is the following. And this, we already kind of discussed this topic. Let me just go through this so we can converge together because I think someone, or maybe see if somebody disagrees. An MIT education has many, many things. But among what it includes is uh, uh, classroom instruction, the traditional passive lecture style, and the smaller Socratic method in which you argue you discuss a great deal. Uh, it includes learning by doing, whether in labs, doing Europe's, these are all coordinated, organized by faculty, and so forth. And includes also learning from peers and projects, which are very, very many of them self-directed and develops all sorts of social skills. A typical MIT education includes this and much more. Now, of all this, where does the online instruction come in? Where does it play any role whatsoever? The only place where it does anything is there. The, the only thing that might change on whatever we do on campus is just here. It's, it's moving from a passive uh, instruction approach in a classroom to a more interactive approach. Everything else will be the same and actually probably will be will be increased. And that's what I meant earlier when I said that we have all this other stuff. If institutions only have this, those are the ones that will be really seriously threatened. Yeah? Wouldn't that be very different though between lab-based disciplines that require uh, specialized and capital-intensive facilities and on the other hand, anything from humanities to computer mm -hmm. science where communication by electronic means can over time not just today, but if we anticipate technological means of 10 or 20 years from now, we really substitute for a lot of that. Or bring, bring communities together in ways that are necessary to resonate. Ah, that is, that, is, that is key. So I think that is key. So you're, you're very right on, on, on the following, in my view. So this is the campus approach. This is the campus experience. So what you're saying is, but wait a minute, we are only at the beginning of using this online technology at the beginning of trying to figure out the social network and, and the potential of crowdsourcing and so forth. So wouldn't that create a competing experience? In my view, it would create another experience that could be just as good, but it will be a different experience. I think it won't be this one, would be a different one. It is my view that the future MIT graduates ought to be comfortable or to be competent in this experience who creates the kind of leaders who can, who can talk to each other, who can persuade each other, who can uh, 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 negotiate with each other, but also the kind of leaders that can use the power of the crowdsource and the power of the virtual approach to also accomplish things. Right now, people teaching uh, MITx subjects they have tried the following experiments. They just simply throw problems, no problem sets, but problems of projects to students online. They just throw them to see what happens. And, and what happens is that tens of thousands of students self-assemble to solve the problem. Now just, just think for a moment of the power of that. So you have an important issue, and you have people all over the world working together who don't know each other to solve the problem. Now, if we ignore that, we're going to be doing great at this, at this conversation in this classroom. We're going to miss the whole world of opportunity that the virtual world can offer us. But if we only do the online, we can do that part, but we'll never be able to do this part well. And the MIT girls of tomorrow have to be competent, conversant, and comfortable on both, on both worlds, on both, on both, ex both um, experiences. So I think this list fails to capture one other aspect, which is 
you don't take one course at a time at MIT. You take six of them, and at the end of the semester... You should get four. <laughs> <laughs> you take six. Yeah. That's the problem with stress on campus, by the way. Talk about stress on campus. You take six, you get stressed. <laughs> okay, but the idea is, uh, in retrospect, right, you, you become much better as a thinker, not because you're doing one, but you're doing many at the same time. That's not important. Um, and <coughs> the list you have here captures it, and the a la carte menu of, say, online instruction, which is on demand, like, I need to become a plumber, and so I learn something else to become a plumber. That type of an approach will take you a lifetime to become well-versed on a variety of disciplines. So how do you balance that? Yeah, well, one thing I just I just I just said to you, I said to somebody earlier that I, I enjoy uh, talking to people and groups and, and giving feedback because even though I've had this presentation I don't know twelve times already, fifteen, I always would get something that I haven't thought before. This is I just that's a great thing you just mentioned. Indeed, when you're taking several things at the same time, you're integrating those in your head. And you learn much better. Uh, that if you take them all sequentially, even though the same material. So uh, I, I, that's a huge advantage that, that the other approach won't, won't compete with. I think, but, but the bottom line is, um, I, I agree with that, and I didn't think of that myself, so I, I, I admit it, and I agree with that. And I agree with a lot of things we're agreeing with here. But at the end of the day, what matters is, is the graduates. And the, that's the product, so to speak. So, I'm going to bet that MIT will always produce the graduates that, that, that are going to make a difference. And I'm going to bet that in the online world, or an online world with, 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 with a summer camp attached to it, uh, that, which is a model that people are, are, are planning on doing, won't produce the same product. But I could be wrong. I'm betting that I'm right. And I'm betting MIT that I'm right. But, but, but what if, if all our graduates from this very, very well organized approach that we have here with, uh, you know, comfortable in the virtual, and the, what, what if those graduates are not, or just they are as good as, as those of, of the other uh, uh, new enterprises? That would tell. I'm convinced that we're going to do it right. And I'm convinced that our products, so to speak, will always be. But the, the point that I was making here is that this is the part, the traditional lecture is the part that online instruction will modify. <clears throat> but the essence of what we do on campus that is great is, is on this, and actually it's here, I'm going to just modify this like what a little, I won't quote you, I'm just explaining this my idea. <laughs> so, 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 because um, uh, I could have thought of it. <laughs> so, so this is, this is the part that is special, but it's, we have it because of the research and the neural enterprise that might be had. If we, if we only had the college environment without the research, we wouldn't be able to do this the way we do it. And, uh, and, and when you talk to many of our undergrads, that's what they tell you makes an IT unique, which is what I said earlier. Okay, enough of this. So this is about uh, uh, the education of the future. I would like MIT to jump ahead and do this. And, uh, and I, I, we have a... a, a um, a workshop, uh, an online summit that we, we are in, doing by invitation in a month or so, I think early March at MIT. Uh, we have like uh, 200 people showing up by invitation from just about every university that does research in America to figure out exactly this idea for me to challenge this is how we're thinking it through. And I have no problem if they disagree with me. Uh, in fact, if they do, they may be really sharpen my thoughts on this. But I need to share this with people for them to just get on, get on the bandwagon, I think it's important. So let me move to, uh, to another topic, which is research. Uh, <clears throat> this is something that I said uh, also uh, in September, that we have to recommit to standing research. And by that I really mean, in this particular sentence, two things. Uh, the, the basic, the fundamental research and the applied research, the one that is mission driven. So these are the two points that I, that I, that I want to make. Uh, this is extremely important, champion basic research. I was in Washington last week making the case. I'm going to go back this Thursday and Friday making the case. Uh, it's very easy to cut basic research funding because you don't see the point. And, 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 and we have to, I, I'm, I'm armed with example for people to see that there is a point. 
that many of the research that we do, many of the benefits of the companies and technology we have in the U.S. today uh, are the result of basic research done 30 and 40 years ago, some 20 years ago. And I have a long list of examples of that, including research, of course, done at MIT. But somehow that people just forget that very easily, and we just have to make the case and prove the case. And that's something that I'm, that I'm doing. The other point is about um, uh, great global challenges. Uh, <clears throat> when, when one of the beauty of, of MIT when it comes to Europe and research is that um, we have projects that are dealing with a great issue, a large issue, whether it's an inter in, in, um, institute-wide like energy initiative or some other project that we're working on. And the beauty of looking to a global challenge is that they don't belong to a discipline. Let me try to explain that. So if you're working on, on an alternative energy source, or if you're working on water, if you're working on something that is badly needed, uh, you as a student of Mickey or physics or, or whatever, you have to find the knowledge you need to solve the problem. The real global challenges don't belong in any discipline. They are just a challenge. And, and, and your education allows you to get the foundations to look for the knowledge you need anywhere you can find it. And that's also the beauty of the Euro approach of the MIT and the research that many of you are doing. That I, I, can, I can assure you, if you think very hard, if you have to think very hard, most of you are doing research and you know that the research you're doing for the projects you're doing doesn't need to be fit within the courses you took as an undergrad. In fact, most of the time they don't. You just have to go where the knowledge is. And to do that, the best way to make sure that that happens is to address not disciplinary challenges, but global challenges. And that's, that's the, other, the other point that I would like us to, to emphasize. So on basic research, uh, the point that I've been making, the point that I've been making the federal government, which are the only ones that really support fundamental research uh, in the US today, is that, that we don't know everything yet. We have a long way to go to know everything. So we need to keep working on expanding our knowledge base. Uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable how people are surprised when you tell them that we don't know everything yet. Uh, it's, it's, it's really amazing uh, uh, that, that that is how some politicians actually think. We're not writing that down, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is, in my view, is an investment in the future. And I think it's not a cost, it's not an expense, it's an investment. And, and, and that, that is, is a very subtle point, but it's an important point. A cost is something you do, okay, you have to expend that money, fine. But this is not uh, spend that money, this is real investment. It does pay off, and I have a long list of examples to prove that it does pay off. And that's the, another thing that I said, that if we give up on that, we basically give up on our future. Because our future is going to be based on the basic research that we're going to do today. Uh, let me move very quickly to great global challenges. Uh, this is actually part of our mission statement, that we, we work on those things. And, uh, and, and with professors at MIT do that naturally. Those are the projects, the kind of projects that you do. What I am trying to do here is just pick a few, like the energy, that are institute-wide, that brings people together from all, all parts of the institute, so we can make a significant difference, but also so that students from any part of MIT can work with students from any part of MIT. Uh, so that's what I mean by institute-wide interdisciplinary. Uh, there, are no, there are a few of those, most of the projects that might have interdisciplinary, but not all of them are institute-wide. Okay, I, what, I, what I've done is I have a group of faculty uh, at the provost office who's working, uh, going around and discussing different options for institute-wide challenges. And uh, these are the list of options that, 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 in fact, the list is a little bit shorter now. Uh, but this, uh, I'm gonna read them to you. For those in the back, it's at the bottom of the page. Um, it started with environment. And the environment, by looking for environment discussions, getting narrower and narrower, and now it's looking into water and food, which are complementary to the energy. Uh, water is going to be, unless we're careful, in 20, 30 years, going to be the next oil. Uh, we just need a lot of it, and we don't have enough supply of it. Um, 
and, and food is a similar similar issue. Uh, manufacturing is another important, uh, is, is making it to the, so water and food is the first one here for those in the back. Manufacturing is the second one. Uh, they, it started by some faculty, it started because uh, the U.S. has dropped its strength in manufacturing. It still is the second largest power in the world in manufacturing, but it's not the first one anymore. China is the first one. So, so uh, and, and we're going down. So that started to be a national concern. But it very quickly became a global concern because, by and large, the low-wage manufacturing that has been driven the economy for the last 20, 30 years, we are beginning the end of that era. So low-wage manufacturing is about to go out the window. And then, if that goes away, what will replace it? You know? And how, how would where manufacturing take place? So that, those kinds of questions are the ones that are being addressed in this one. I haven't announced any of this. Don't put that on the tag. I haven't announced it. Uh, but but these, are, these are the kinds of things that we are, we are thinking. The, the next one is, is health, healthcare and health. Uh, this country spends about 18%, almost 20% of the GDP in health. And that increases. So we've got to do something about it. And we have a great deal of technology that can be used for that and a great deal of system thing that can be used for that. These three are making it to the top. Big data is also important, but it's going to be mostly uh, supporting all of this because big data is really everywhere. And uh, another one that has been discussed at the Intelligence Initiative on um, some faculty in DCS with, with Sloan, uh, and that's going to be doing fine. It's going to be here, but it's not going to be probably, at this point, it doesn't look like it's going to be easy to wide. I will cover all those five schools. So those are the areas in which uh, if, 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 if conversations with faculty computer, well, I will be announcing probably in the next few months. I may be announcing water and food first, and then I will be announcing some studies, uh, a study group for manufacturing and health to have an announcement on an issue or not, maybe a year or two from now. But those are, those are just plans to give you a sense of where I'm going, yeah? Uh, so what I'm addressing here are, um, or, uh, programs that I wanted to be easy to buy, that I just want to put the weight of my office to raise the money for them to be across the whole of MIT. But, but, but I help, and, and most probably don't need my help to raise money to do all the things they do. So, so it's not like I'm going to focus on these priorities. These are the things that I think some of them, if not all of them, I want us to do for MIT as a whole. Yeah. But, but, but to, the seriousness of your question, the plan that I have right now is that we have some money. When we had the last budget crisis, 08 or 09, we really didn't have much money to handle that at all. Uh, and I and I worked with the corporation for us to go through a transition so that MIT uh, would not hurt significantly. And MIT actually hurt relatively little because even though we had to cut about $120 million from the academic side, the research side was growing. So basically, most of the people that we had to uh, lay off from the academic side got jobs on the research side. So the academic side got hurt somewhat in terms of the delivery of the education, and by and large, not that much. But people didn't hurt that much because we had, we had that. But right now, um, if sequestration happens, the economy may, may hurt too. So we're gonna, we may have a problem on the academic side, and we won't have a research side grow. But we saw that possibility, and we started building, basically, uh, 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 we have a bank account, so to speak. We have money set aside for contingencies like this. So the plan is that if something like this were to happen, the grad students we have right now, the RAs we have right now, will figure out a way to cover what we have right now. So, but, but unless we find a way to replenish our other sources, the worst case scenario is that in two, three years, we'll have $40 million less. So we have a number of fewer grad students, and fewer postdocs, any postdocs will be probably, any postdocs in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm joking. I think that my point is that you know, we have to make some adjustments. I don't expect that to be the case. My problem is what do we do in the transition? And we build, when I was told, we build that, savings 
kidneys so that we can cover something like this. So we are safe on that account. And we're going to have to just ramp up the other source of funding. So it was an excellent question. Uh, so I'll be done very, very quickly. So, so this is where I'm going on this. And I think uh, the other point is one of community. I'm going to make this very, very fast. Uh, there are more slides, but these are the three major points. Let me go back to undergraduates. Uh, we, MIT is a tremendous engine of, of innovation and entrepreneurship. I mean, like if you saw the Kaufman report by Ed Roberts, we have about 26,000 companies created by living alumni. That's a staggering number. Think of it for a moment. We have 125,000 living alumni. And they have created 25,000, 26,000 companies. Just look at the ratio. Of course, that doesn't mean that, that that's the ratio. I mean, it just means that quite a few alumni are, you know, have zero entrepreneurs, they have quite a few companies. But these are leading active companies. So things many people would say are going fine from that regard. But, but something else is going on that it used to be that you came to MIT and you spent four years here. And then uh, uh, after that, you, 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 during that, you got the bug of being uh, um, uh, an entrepreneur, and then you leave MIT, you try a few things, and then you start a company. Uh, but, but the age that you start companies, in, in the, every decade is going to younger and younger and younger. And this, for the last five, 10 years, uh, we started seeing a trend in which the MIT undergraduates, a growing fraction of them, they come here with the idea that they might want to start a company, and they want to learn about entrepreneurship. They want to learn what that is. We have many options to learn that, many different opportunities to learn that, but it's not organized as a curriculum, as a program. Uh, it's not being put together for you to follow. And, and that's something that I believe we need to do, and it's something I'm going to pay some attention to. So this is this point here. Uh, global impact, that's, uh, I said earlier that I think an MIT undergrad should graduate, and, and, and all graduates should in the future should be competent in, in, in the physical world, interacting as, as, as individuals uh, in, in person, but also be competent and comfortable in the virtual world. But in addition to that, all of us, all of you, have to be competent <coughs> globally. You really have to understand the global context in which you work, because you are competing with people all over the world. Uh, uh, and and that, that means that we need to figure out how to provide those opportunities. For undergrads, maybe one of the easiest ones is the MISTI program. And uh, if you're familiar with it, the last year, MISTI sent, I think, like 700 students uh, in the summer to do internships. Uh, and, and that's a terrific program, and we need to increase it. The demand is much bigger than that. So that's what I mean by, by, by this part, that providing more of the, of the global impact. Um, with students learning the global culture, and also with global engagement of MIT looking as on the side aside uh, on, on, fed, on, on funding to replace federal funding as well. And, and the last point is one about just a community uh, in which we have, uh, we focus on our values of this community, which, is very, which are very strong, our values of integrity, but also values of diversity and inclusion. And I have a few more slides that cover this point, but this is basically the highlight. So with that, uh, do I have any, any, are there any more questions, or am I done, or what? you're the boss here, you tell me what to do. So you can take one or two questions, if you want to discuss. One or two questions. I'm very happy to listen to your lecture. Um, I have a question, um, which is more about uh, the transparency of our, our institution. I mean, I once talked to my uh, department dean, and he said, uh, I have already been here for five years, and then I understand how MIT works, because there huge amounts of information and how to make the, that institution more transparent. You know, I, I think here the year 2010, I probably will graduate, graduate this year, but still there are so many parts that I'm still confused. I, I, I bet all you guys have some questions about how you know, how, how it really gets the information that you need efficiently. How Boy, you leave the, at the end the toughest <laughs> question you're going to ask. Uh, MIT is a, actually every university is a very complex institution. I, I don't know how to, honestly I don't know how to solve the problem. Uh, we, uh, uh, when I was provost, uh, we arranged every year 
uh, in September, I'm sorry, uh, the, the week before Labor Day, we had um, uh, a couple of days to um, basically educate new faculty into MIP. It's just faculty. These are people who, who you know, have quite a good experience, and, and they have also some of them worked elsewhere. And, and, and we tried to accommodate all sort of things in a couple of days for them to learn about how MIT works, not for them to really understand in two days because it's impossible, but at least to remember where where to go and get information if they need to whenever they need it. And uh, uh, it just is it's, 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 it's never been perfect even for that. It's just hard to put together everything in, in any way or organize in any way that, that uh, I think part of the problem is that Whatever we tell you ahead of time that you don't need to know, it's hard for you to capture. When you need to know something, then you want to know the answer. You want to know where to learn about that. So we cannot really prepare you. We just have to make sure that the information is more or less available to you when you need it. And even that is hard. Uh, I think of, of, you know, searching a website to find information is not trivial. So, I don't know how to do that except perhaps put together a group of people with that task and, and spend six months or a year or something and tell me what is that we should do. We have tried all sorts of things, not this approach, but with people worrying about how to make their units more transparent.